Hello and welcome to AP Human Geography, Chapter 7, Key Issue 4, as presented in the Rubenstein, The Cultural Landscape book. We're going to take a look at why do ethnicities engage in ethnic cleansing and genocide. These are terrible atrocities, horrible things to do to people. Why are they even happening? Ethnic cleansing. This is where you have a more powerful ethnic group that forcibly removes a less powerful group to create a homogenous region, meaning they want to get rid of people who are different from them so they can create an area where everybody is the same. Now the largest sampling of this happening was during and after World War II when we see the forcible removal of Jews, Gypsies, and other such ethnicities between the years of 1935 and 1945. And we all know what happened in the concentration camps there um, that was orchestrated by the Nazis in Germany. But during the World War and after the war, you saw mass migrations of ethnicities because um, they were forced or they didn't want things to happen to them again. Now let's look at Yugoslavia. If you look over here, we're in the Balkan Peninsula, which to get a reference for where that is, you see Greece down here, you see Italy, the boot over here. So Yugoslavia used to be a country that housed multiple ethnicities within its one country or nationality. So it, this area had a large history, it had a long history of conflict. After World War I, the country of Yugoslavia was created by the Allies due to everyone speaking the similar South Slavic language. So they called it Yugo, which was the prefix meaning South. The nationalities that were housed within this country were the Croats, Macedonians, Montenegrins, Serbs, and Slovenes. They also spoke different languages. They spoke Croatian, Macedonian, Serbian, and Slovene. On top of that, you have different religions. You have the Roman Catholics, you have the Eastern Orthodox, and Islam. So there's lots of different backgrounds here and people that are very passionate about what they believe, how they speak, and how they live. So, of course, it's going to be a problem. Well, in 1953, you had President Bras Tito, who governed over this, this state, this nationality of Yugoslavia here, and everything was fine because he was a really good leader that was able to hold everything together and taught everyone to celebrate their differences. That's kind of like what we try to do in our class, right? But when he died in, in, uh, in 1990, the state of Yugoslavia quickly went downhill because everyone started to feel independent, they felt separate, and their differences were things that came up as blockades from staying together. So it went downhill from there. And in fact, this term called Balkanization, this here of course is the Balkan Peninsula, Balkanization means a state which a, uh, a state when a nation breaks down through its conflict of ethnicities. And that term is used you know, commonly today. So we dig in to one of the states that used to be in former, former Yugoslavia, and that's Bosnia and Herzegovina. The large ethnicities within that former state were Serbians, Croatians, and Bosnian Muslims. What happened is, you had the majority of Bosn Bosnian Muslims over here, 48%, but the Serbs and Croatians got together because they felt like they were kind of similar ethnicities, and they decided to attempt to force out the Bosnian Muslims. And so you had a, a large conflict there, and that still continues on to this day. Another region in former Yugoslavia was Kosovo. It is Kosovo to this day. But when Yugoslavia dissolves, you had a situation where Serbia wanted to force their way into the region of Kosovo and get rid of the Albanians who they felt were encroaching on their territory. So because of this, the United States and European allies began an air campaign striking the Serbians to push them back to allow the Albanians to have what they felt like was their territory. In the end, the conflict basically remains to this day, and it still hasn't been resolved. So we look at an example of how these conflicts get documented. And when the situation in Kosovo was happening, there were a lot of people in the United States uh, and European nations who couldn't grasp the atrocities that were going on. They couldn't believe it. And so here is a specific example. This is aerial photography of a town called Glodane in Kosovo. And what we see here 
is the place where the citizens, the Albanians, lived. You can see their houses right here and some of their, their buildings and places of business. But what you also see, these red circles here, are armored, are armored vehicles. These are vehicles that are coming to force the people out of their houses. And those are Serbian armored vehicles. Over here in the red area, you see all the vehicles of the Albanians. They're all piled up in one area. And what starts to feel awful is you can see all the people rounded up in one area. They're displaced because of the violence in their home region. So just outside of where they're living, this dark area, this is all masses of people. And they're piled up here. And what the aerial photography revealed was that in this picture, you can see all the people here and you can see their vehicles. In the following pictures that were taken, there were no people, there were no vehicles, and their houses were all on fire. So this is one of the proofs that the world was able to see and get involved with the atrocities that were going on in Kosovo. All right, so now we're moving over to Africa. Specifically, we're looking at the region of the Sudan, which used to be the country of Sudan, but it's, it's now split up into South and uh, South Sudan and Sudan. Genocide. We move from ethnic cleansing, which is terrible on its own, to a description where we see the mass killing of a group of people, not to move them out, but to eliminate them from existence. So this is different from ethnic cleansing, which, I mean, honestly, they're kind of the same, because in the other examples, people were killing each other. So this is one of those political terms that is a gray area for who's trying to define it and for what reason. But in any case, we see here in the region of the Sudan, in 1980s, a civil war broke out between the black Christian and animist rebels versus the Arab Muslim government in the north. So the Arab Muslim government, they attempted to create one nationality with only Muslim traditions. They have laws that separate genders at all events, at school functions, and on all transportation. So this became an enormous conflict because you had the Muslim background and then you had the Christian and animus background and that didn't mesh well together. Specifically, you may have heard of the Darfur region, which is on the western part of Sudan, where you had black Africans rise up. They were rebelling due to discrimination and neglect in 2003. This is where you started to see this horrendous conflict. But because the government wanted their control, they incorporated some Arab nomads and they began a, a fight that slaughtered people by the hundreds of thousands. In fact, this is one of the largest atrocities that the world has ever known. And this was, you know, during, during my uh, years in high school with you guys, uh, where you are now. But over a few years, you saw 480,000 killed by this conflict. This is genocide. genocide. They're going to wipe these people off the face of the earth. There was not on top of that, there's 2.8 million people displaced in refugee camps. So it was a horrendous situation. We look at Ethiopia and Eritrea. So we zoom in. We're on the Horn of Africa over here. Um, we've got Ethiopia, which was an independent nation for 2,000 years. Basically, as, as long as you can think back, Ethiopia is an independent nation, taking care of itself. Then in 1890, Eritrea becomes an Italian colony, meaning Italy came in and they took it over. In the 1930s, after World War I, and moving into World War II, Italy captures Ethiopia, which is this region right here. So Ethiopia dissolves, I'm sorry, so after World War II, when the Nazis and the Axis powers are pushed back, Italy moves out of there and the United Nations gives Eritrea to Ethiopia. So it gives a small area to Ethiopia. And it's given that with the premise that they're going to be fair and they're going to be equal rights for both areas. But really, that doesn't happen at all. Because why would this ethnicity group in Ethiopia want to watch over a different ethnic group in Eritrea? Specifically, when Ethiopia dissolves a language in Eritrea and dissolves their government, you know we're going to have problems. So a 30-year civil war begins in 1961 and it lasts until 1991, where Eritrea does win independence officially. Of course, it didn't last, and in 1998, another war broke out. It continues, because they have this border dispute right here on whose land this actually is. And even when we dig in, zoom in to Eritrea, 
we've got ethnic conflict within that country. We've got conflict between the Muslims and the Christians. The same thing in Ethiopia. We've got lots of ethnicities within Ethiopia, as small as a country it is, as it is. But mainly, we're looking at turmoil between the Christians and the Muslims. Somalia. Now we're really on the Horn of Africa. In the 1990s, the government collapses. You have struggle for control by a series of clans, each with separate armies. You have complex alliances that form, and they interact with each other. In 1992, the U.S. sends troops in to protect relief organizations like the Red Cross who are there to, you know, serve, protect, bring medicine and uh, para paramedicine, you know, trying to heal people who are in these terrible conditions, and people bringing in food, and they can't do it. So the U.S. sends in troops to protect the relief organizations. In 1994, these peace talks fail, so things start to collapse again. Islamist militias take control in 2004, and back in 2007, you have the U.S. that comes in, they're bombing because, of course, they're wanting to fight terrorists. So this poor area of the globe is just bombarded. The situation continues to be worsened, and it's not looking good because we've got drought that's just devastated the region. So poor Africa, they cannot get a leg up. Central Africa. Rwanda. We're looking at the Hutus versus the Tutsis. And if you have seen the movie Hotel Rwanda, which is what we're doing right now during this unit in AP Human Geography, you might know what's going on. So historically, the Tutsi are cattle herders. They come in and they overtake the Hutu farmers that lived in the region of Rwanda about 400 years ago. So back historically, we have a problem. When Germany invades and takes over, Rwanda in World War I, they start to be the first group of people that really make sure people are separated and identified, furthering this problem between these two ethnicities. After World War II, Rwanda is governed by Belgium, who separates them officially by giving them identity cards. So we really start to see that even though they look alike, and we probably couldn't tell them apart, they have identity cards that separate them. Rwanda gains independence in 1962, and the Hutus choose this as their time to clear out the Tutsis. And so the Tutsis, they retreat to Uganda. Just a number of years later, like not even 30 years later, the Tutsis come back and they create incredible conflict. And this is where you really get into the Rwandan genocide. In 1994, the Hutu president is assassinated, which is cause for incredible mass genocides where 800,000 Tutsis are killed in three months. This conflict, although it settled down, it continues as it poured into the neighboring countries in Africa. And of course the Congo. This Hutu and Tutsi conflict, it did continue. It spilled over to other regions of Africa. Within the Congo, you've got 5.4 million people that died during this civil war between the Hutu and the Tutsi. This is the deadliest in the Congo since World War II. The Tutsis overthrow President Mobutu in 1997, and they start to kill all the Hutus. So the Hutus get neighboring countries to join in, and they go against the Tutsis, and this conflict just continues. So we look at the colonial legacy of Africa, and really we don't see many good things. What we do see is Europeans, North Americans, taking resources back to their countries and leaving the continent of Africa in turmoil. There are boundaries there, but really they're created politically by the European countries. They set them in and they split them up between the European countries. But they didn't take into indication, they didn't take into account the tribes and ethnicities when they were making these boundaries. So these tribes and ethnicities, they are separated. So how can you have one tribe, one ethnicity between two nations? That's going to cause conflict. So really, we've got some bad situations made worse by political factors. That's our look at Human Geography Chapter 7, Key Issue 4. I appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you again.